Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm in my workshop, and you might have noticed that I've got some cool project next to me here. I'm not quite ready to talk about this yet. This will be the topic of future videos, so if you don't want to miss them, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Today we're going to talk about this little beauty here. This is a DIY motorized focuser, but not any motorized focuser. This was specifically designed for off-axis guiders. So you might wonder, why would I ever need uh, a motorized focuser on an off-axis guider? That's a great question. So in this first video, I'm going to explain why I decided to design this device, what it can do for you, how to build your own, and then in a subsequent video, I will explain how to calibrate and use this device. So let's get started. When I first got started in astrophotography, about a year and a half ago, I was using a guide scope, which you can see on this photograph. It was solidly mounted on the back of my refractor using heavy duty rings and a heavy duty Lost Mandy dovetail saddle, which I had purchased from ADM accessories. Overall, I was feeling really good about my setup. Around the same time, I started noticing that even though the guiding accuracy reported by PHG2 was very good, the stars in my photographs were never quite round. They were always slightly elongated, as you can see on this sample. Whatever that happens, and whether it is caused by optical aberrations, poor guiding, wind gusts, or even cable snags, you can be sure that you are losing resolution over the entire image. And that is why I started looking into the root cause of my issue. So I posted a question on the CloudNets forum, and people immediately responded that it was probably differential flexure. So to be sure, I was instructed to take a series of one minute exposures without dithering, and then blink them in PixInsight. And here is the result of this little experiment. As you can see, the field is drifting in spite of the excellent guiding accuracy reported by PHD2. And this is a clear evidence that I had some differential flexure somewhere in my system. Instead of spending countless hours trying to diagnose where that flexure was coming from, I decided to try using an off-axis guider. So I went ahead and purchased an OAG from ZWO along with their helical focuser. And it immediately resolved my problem. My stars were now nice and round, and my guiding accuracy, as reported by PHG2, actually got even better. Now I routinely guide at 0.4 arc second RMS, and sometimes even better. As good as this sounds, the OEG actually brought a number of new challenges which I did not have to deal with before. First, when using an OEG, the field of view is very small, which sometimes makes it difficult for the guiding software to detect guide stars, especially in spring or fall, when you're imaging galaxies that are located far away from the plane of the Milky Way, where there just aren't that many stars to begin with. Second, the OEG requires some amount of refocusing when switching filters. Why would that be? Remember that an OEG is always placed before the filter wheel while the imaging camera is placed after the filter wheel. Filters are not always parfocal, and refractors, which a lot of us like to use for imaging, do not focus all wavelengths at the same distance. What this means is that when changing filters, we usually have to adjust the focus of the main imaging camera, and that is done using filter offsets. Here you can see how I have my filter offsets set up in Nina. The problem is that because the OAG is placed before the filter wheel, when adjusting the focus point of the imaging train to bring the main imaging camera into focus following a filter change, you are effectively moving the guide camera out of focus. And here is a video showing this exact problem. While guiding software like PHD2 can accommodate slightly out-of-focus guide stars by computing their centroid, out-of-focus guide images can contain a drastically lower number of detected guide stars, and those that are detected will have a much lower signal-to-noise ratio, further reducing the accuracy of the centroid computation. In some situations, PHD2 may not even be able to detect a single guide star, 
and guiding will be impossible. This has happened to me in the past, and I was forced to manually refocus the guide camera independently of the main imaging camera using the little helical focuser that came with the OAG. Manually refocusing the guide camera throughout the night is not exactly what I enjoy doing most. Also, I have a day job and I need to get some sleep, so I look for ways to automate that. And Pegasus Astro sells a motorized OAG named Scops OAG. However, at $750 US, it is a little bit expensive for me, even though it does look like a fantastic unit. Additionally, I discussed with the Nina developers on their Discord server. Since Nina can only connect to one focuser at a time, there was no good solution yet to deal with Scopes OAG. It is certainly possible to run a second instance of Nina that connects to both Scopes OAG and the guide camera, but there is no way to have two Nina instances communicate with one another to do something smart upon filter change. All of this has led me to come up with my own solution to this problem, and that is what this device we are talking about today was designed for. Before we go any further, let's see how well it works with my setup. Here you can see the OEG focuser attached to my imaging train, and upon selecting a new filter, the OEG focuser adjusts the focus of the guide camera. You may also notice that it has backlash compensation built in. I will cover that in a subsequent video when I talk about how to calibrate the device. Now let's see how well it is able to compensate for differences in focus. Isn't this awesome? All right, before we talk about how to build this device, let me address a few important points. First of all, this device is not for everyone. It really depends on a lot of factors. For example, if you are not using a refractor and if all of your filters came from the same set and the filter manufacturer claims that they are parfocal, then you may not even need this device at all because the difference in focus between filters will be so minuscule that you probably won't even need to worry about it. However, if you are using a refractor, or if you use filters that are not parfocal, you may need this device. The only way to find out is to focus your main imaging camera, and then assuming that you've already defined your filter offsets, go through every single filter in your filter wheel. After every filter change, your imaging application, like Nina in my case, will adjust the focus of your imaging train depending on the filter offset you have defined for the selected filter. And you should look at the image coming out of your GAT camera, for example, in PHD2. In my case, as you saw earlier in this video, the stars in my GAT camera can be pinpoint when I'm using uh, the luminance filter, but they become large disks after switching to the red filter. That is how you know that this device can be useful for you. This definitely is not for everybody, but the people who have this problem I just described did not really have a good solution until now. One final note, this device and the accompanying software can be used to motorize any helical focuser, regardless of how you use that focuser. For example, you could theoretically use it to control the focus of your entire imaging train if that is what you wanted to do. All right, let's see how I build this project now. As usual with all of my projects, I created a GitHub repository. I will leave a link to that repository in the description below. That repository contains everything you need to build this device, including the 3D FreeCAD model files 
and ready to print STL files. The blueprint for the electronic circuit, the Arduino firmware, the ASCOM driver, the code for a standalone Windows application to directly control the focuser and set its zero position, and of course, a very extensive documentation file that I hope includes everything you might need to build this project on your own. You will need a basic 3D printer to print the gears and the body of the focuser. I use an affordable Creality Ender 3 V2, and it is perfectly adequate for this project. The parts are relatively straightforward to create for anyone who has a little bit of experience with 3D printing. You will also need to install brass inserts, which are very common in 3D printing. The large gear is simply press fit onto the focuser outer ring, and no glue is necessary. Before attaching the large gear to the ZWO focuser ring, I recommend loosening the four set screws visible on the ZWO focuser ring. The focuser itself should be very easy to move with very little force. Likewise, the pinion gear is press fit onto the stepper motor shaft. For the electronic circuit, I recommend testing everything using a breadboard first. Simply upload the Arduino firmware using the Arduino IDE, install the ASCOM driver on a Windows computer, and use the standalone Windows application to see whether you can control the stepper motor. Note that the LEDs are only used during the prototyping phase. The main components involved are an Arduino Nano, a ULN2003 transistor array, and a stepper motor. The exact components are listed in the readme file in the GitHub repository. Here's what the final circuit board looks like. It can be a little bit tricky to solder all of these tiny components, but take your time and test your connections along the way using a multimeter. The connectors I used are standard JST connectors, because that is what I had lying around in my shop, but you can use any connector you want. The circuit board itself is attached to the body using three screws. And here is what the final product looks like. All right, so that's all I have for you today. I hope you found this video useful. If you do decide to build this device on your own and you have a question, you can leave it in the comments below, or even better, you can file an issue on the GitHub repository, and I will update the instructions accordingly so that they're a little bit clearer and a little bit better for the next person. I will publish a follow-up video on this channel about this device, probably sometime in August, maybe September. It will be specifically around the calibration procedure, like, uh, setting the zero position, measuring backlash, calculating the step ratio, and so on. Uh, so if you don't want to miss the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And until next time, thank you for watching.